The 76ers have traded James Harden. How does that impact the Celtics? There might be one way, actually, that could help them. We'll talk about that and some takeaways from a 3-0 and start right now on the Locked On Celtics podcast. Be ever ready. Recognize the city of champs. Boston, baby, we do what you can. Locked on number 18, Tatum and Brown, J team. Step back, we gon' wet that and slay teams. Of course, the Celtics, who else could it be? Screaming like KG with the Larry OB. Corral is above average, assessing the team status. Best daily pod, no cap, salary matching. Clutch like Bird to DJ, keep John on replay. Primetime, dapping up the truth on the sideline. Rain and Jays, how it started, raising banners, how we finished. Locked on Celtics pod, home of the winners. B. Welcome back to the Lockdown Celtics podcast right here on the Lockdown Podcast Network. Your team every day. I got you every day here with a free, fresh podcast. Drop directly to your device if you subscribe. So find this show wherever you get your podcast. Watch it on YouTube. Hop in the comment section. Let me know what you're thinking. I'm John Corrales. Once upon a time, long, long ago, played ball. And now I'm a beat writer covering the Celtics for Boston Sports Journal. James Harden was traded. We'll talk about that. We're going to talk about some takeaways from the first three games, three uh, very distinctly different games. And we're going to bring in Tom Westerholm, who's got snowy steps behind him. I do. In the YouTube, you got snow just, wow. Yeah, it's, snow it's trying to take over. I'm going to uh, I'm, I'm going to start the pod by waiting as long to respond to you as it took Woj to announce trade details last night. <laughs> So that's it. Tom will not be speaking for the rest of the podcast. Thanks, Tom Westerholm. Yep, that was yep. wild. That was wild. Appreciate you as always. Absolutely the wildest thing. Uh, by the way, today's show brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get a $150 bonus bet. Uh, $150 in bonus bets. A little bit different. With any winning $5 money line bet, that's $150. If your team wins, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. So it's 2 a.m. I, I was in Washington last night. After the game, you know, back, back in my hotel room, podcast is done. I'm wrapped up. I'm laying down. It's 2 a.m. I'm like, one more pass through Twitter. One more pass. And then I see my my notifications. Oh, there's a there's a Walsh tweet here. Thinking it's nothing. Thinking maybe it's an injury. And then boom, the the trade gets announced. I'm like, oh my God. Here comes the normal flood. Shams is going to be right behind him. Then they're going to be dueling details, and it's just going to be the next 15 minutes of like, wow, let's see what they got. Did they, you know, did they get man? Did they get this? Did they get? And then silence, nothing. Half an hour goes by at two in the morning, and we're all like, hello? <laughs> Whoa, <just> wake up. <laughs> it was like wild, man. Um, but I will, I will say, Tom. For a brief moment, as my dog barks in the background at trick-or-treaters, for a brief moment, I enjoyed the return of just old-school Twitter. Just sitting around, having fun at a weird moment. And yeah. it, was, it was a lot of fun. Um, but the way God intended. Just, that's just, exactly what it was here for. Just so, sitting around, you know, yeah, yeah. Everybody so, cracking jokes. Just having fun. So, and James Harden is now gone. He's a former Sixer. He's gone to the LA Clippers. The deal is uh, PJ Tucker, Harden, PJ Tucker, and Philip Petrosev for Marcus Morris, Robert Covington, Nick Batum, KJ Martin. Uh, 2028 unprotected first round pick, two second round picks, a 29, 2029, 2029 pick swap, and a first round pick from the OKC Thunder. I'm not sure what the OKC Thunder are doing in this deal. Um, but regardless, it, it's basically a bunch of spare parts for, uh, for James Harden. And I feel like Tyrese Maxey going off, Eastern Conference Player of the Week, kind of between that, between the player participation investigation where the league's like, you've got to play this guy. And um, just between those things, it kind of forced Daryl Morey's hand. And so the question here is for listeners of our podcast, does this, how does this impact the Sixers? And 
should the Celtics be worried at all about this? No. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know, man. I but I like to be clear, like I don't I didn't think the Sixers were a threat before. Like Tyrese Maxey is good. He's a good player. Like yeah. I think, you know, you, you watch the improvements he's made this year are really impressive. Like there's been people have made fun of the the 76ers for years now for their weird Tyrese Maxey obsession. And, you know, I think we're starting to get a little bit of a sense of like, oh, yeah, like this this guy could be a real good player. Um, Joel Embiid was the MVP last year. And it's like, you know, in retrospect, I probably wouldn't have voted. You know, I didn't vote, obviously. But, I, you know, retrospect, I wouldn't have probably voted for him. But it's like it's not like it was crazy. He was an MVP player. You know, he was he was that caliber player. These guys are really good. But like you just go up and down the Sixers team. I understand, you know, that they, they, you know, brought in some some wing depth, whatever. Like, I don't know. Sure. None of this moves me. The two teams in the Eastern Conference yeah. are the Bucks and the Celtics. Like this did nothing to do that. And, and look, I mean, maybe the Sixers can find some kind of impact player with their, you know, with with, with these draft picks. Maybe maybe there's something else on the horizon. Um, but as things stand right now, even with those draft picks, even with the promise of some, you know, tertiary player coming in, I just don't see it. I just think the Celtics and the Bucks are a completely different level, a completely different, you know, collect like just a much more talented collection of, of, of players. And I'm yeah, the Sixers don't move me at this stage. No, they don't move me either. And it's I, I think this is kind of like Maury. We've just seen it so much. Like, what are we doing here? <laughs> it's 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 Maury just kind of like delaying, trying to like like I said before, he he had the the the, the league breathing down his neck. Mm-hmm. Um there 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 was the looming because of that, the looming pressure that Harden was going to have to play. Um, and it's like, I don't know if you've watched Friends. I, I'm not the biggest Friends fan in the world, but there is a scene where Chandler, rest in peace, Matthew Perry, uh, Chandler and Phoebe were trying to like, there was like a competition because Chandler and Monica were together. And it's like, they were just in a stare and I'm like, I'm going to kiss you now. And I'm also prepared to kiss you now. And there was just like this big fake, like tension. It's, it's like Harden and Maury were like, I am coming to report to a game. I am going to play basketball now. <laughs> and Maury's like, I am also prepared for you to play basketball. <laughs> we are excited to play basketball. Like yeah. that's the moment that we these are guys ramping are you up. <laughs> yes. We are prepared for you to play. However, we need you to get into shape. I am prepared to get into shape. It's just this big <laughs> fake dance where yeah. these guys were like, it, it just was never, it was never tenable, especially like, like Tyrese Maxey forced uh, Maury to make the deal yeah. because there was no way, none that you could put Harden on the floor with Maxey at this point. Because well, it destroys everything that he was doing. <laughs> Absolutely. And in front of a Philadelphia crowd, like, oh, God. Boom. Yeah. No. Like, that was that video that was floating around of the guy in the Michael Myers costume saying, like, bring me hard. And, like, <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, it was, I mean, it was over. That whole situation was so over. And you can almost, I mean, you can almost hear the conversation between Maury and the Clippers, right? Like, like Maury calling up the Clippers and just being like, okay. If I can't have Terrence Mann, can can I get, get like, like w- a little more draft something? Yeah, Just something. get get. Can you make me not look like an idiot here? Would that be okay? <laughs> and then the Clippers being like, yeah, yeah all right. And like you yeah. know, it's it's just like it, it, yeah. Once well, once Terrence Mann was like not the the do all end all be all you know break all player in this whole saga. Yeah, yeah. then it, I'm sure it came together very very easily. You're like you know. Um, yeah, no, it it was untenable. There was no way that the James Harden Philadelphia 76ers saga could continue. No, it couldn't. And so, yeah, all, all of these pieces, I mean, Covington, could he play the PJ Tucker role? Maybe. Like not as not quite as tough, but like he can, yeah. he can do it. I mean, he knows Philly, he's been there. Uh, you know, Batum can contribute. Can Martin contribute? Can Morris, Marcus Morris contribute? I don't know, maybe. Can, but can, like, yeah, can, can one, of, <laughs> one of these. That's <laughs> the 3-0, uh, which is great. Um, but 
that that's it. Like that that doesn't right now for this season, potentially for this season, because they could flip somebody at the in for somebody at the trade deadline. I don't sure. know who that's gonna be. I don't know who's gonna become available, but you never know. It's too early to tell. So for now, the Celtics, you look at the Sixers and you say, Hey, that's great that Tyrese Maxey's going off. So, sorry. Uh, uh you know who's gonna be available at the trade deadline is James Harden, but continue. <laughs> That might be true. Uh, but congratulations, Tyrese Maxey. You get to face the backcourt of Derek White and Drew Holiday by yourself. Good luck with that. And yeah, Joel Embiid is still Joel Embiid. And he, is he going to eat Porzingis alive? Maybe. But also, so. yeah. Uh, so great. Then he'll, he scores 50 and Tyrese Maxey has eight turnovers that lead to you know, eight, 16 Celtics points and the, the Sixers lose. Like, who cares? Uh, but Tom, there is one way maybe this trade can actually benefit the Celtics, which would be kind of funny the way this off season has gone. We'll talk about that in just a second. First today's show brought to you by our good friends over at FanDuel. This is a great time of year because you got football kind of in, in full swing. You're almost halfway through the season. I think. Uh, basketball is just starting. The teams are, have played two, three, four games. So that's, that's kind of fun to, to just get started. And if you're a new customer, you want to get into the action on fanduel.com slash locked on, you place one $5 money line bet. If you win $150 in bonus bets, so not only do you win whatever you win, you get $150 in bonus bets back. If your team wins so you can go and bet that on anything spreads player props over unders whatever you got because that that app is so easy to use it's so widespread there's so many options uh and it's it's really great so go check it out fanduel.com slash locked on that's how you get this deal that's how they know that we sent you there fanduel is it's all like i said it's a lot of fun uh, a lot of options there so go check it out fanduel.com slash locked on i'm all for it if you want to gamble just ask you Please use the tools that FanDuel has. Use the tools to set up some safeguards and please gamble responsibly. Thank you for making Lockdown Celtics your first listen every day. Going to talk much, much more on the James Harden trade on the Lockdown NBA podcast. That's my night with uh, with Jake Madison of the Lockdown Pelicans podcast. We're regulars there on the Wednesday night podcast. So if you want my full, full, full Harden take uh, with some other some other thoughts that I have, Check it out there on the Locked On NBA podcast. Find it wherever you found this one. Tom Westerholm, can I interest you in one lightly used Danny Green as a potential as we start to shift between the Sixers and our second topic, takeaways from the 3-0 start. One of the takeaways from the 3-0 start is, huh, bench? Mm, eh, struggling. Yeah. Struggling. I said in last night's podcast, for anybody who's listening to this podcast, you didn't listen to last night's podcast, not a point of concern yet. Three games is way too soon. These guys need time to kind of get their, their footing. However, open roster spot, Danny Green, he's won a championship. He knows. He gets it. Uh, he's a professional. He can hit a shot. He can still go out there and play a little bit, you know. And look, a guy who can hit a shot and – you know, at his age, is he going to be able to defend the, the way he used to? No, but he knows defense. He's not what he used to be. I'm not going to pretend like, oh, go get Danny Green, and this is going to fix everything. But on a on a on a bench that has been struggling, and you wonder, okay, what's the harm in adding one more guy that can hit a shot potentially? I say there is no harm. Yeah, I'm not opposed at all. I at some point. The Celtics, like one of these shooty guys has to make <laughs> his shooty shots. They've got to at some point. Oh, like, that's going to be the headline. One of these shooty guys has to make his shooty shots. Like, okay, uh, you know, it, it's it, these shots are so open. Like Sam Hauser is getting such good looks. And, uh, you know, you got you, you to gotta have somebody who can knock those looks down. And could Danny Green do it? I don't know. But, like. He's done it before. He's been mm -hmm. around for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, um, getting a wide open shot is not going to phase him in any way. He's he's worked himself, you know, out of slumps. He's, he's he's done all the things that an NBA shooter needs to be able to do. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a good idea. I'm slightly 
more concerned about the bench, I think, than you are, I think, uh, from the sound of things. I just like my problem is that we've just seen these things from these guys before, right? So I think sure the thing with Sam Hauser is like if you are like counting on him to win you games with his three-point shooting, you're gonna be in trouble. Or if you're counting on him to be a consistent three-point shooter, it seems like you're gonna be in trouble because he's he's the kind of 40% three-point shooter who makes 60% for a while and then you know. 10, 15, 20% for a while and can't make anything. And it's like, that's fine. That'll pick you up some wins during the season. But it's just when that guy is a really key part of your rotation, that's, eh, you start to get a little squishy. Peyton Pritchard, we've seen him not be the best in a role where he's not the, where he doesn't have a 30% usage rating. Like, and he's not going to have a 30% usage rating for the rest of the season if things go swimmingly. Like, so it's just like, you know, there's these little things where it's like, I'm, I'm not like, I'm not panicking, right? I'm, I, I'm in agree with, agreement with you about that. But I do think it's like, you know, you look at a player like Danny Green, if, if there's, you know, buyout guys like that, and you have a chance to, you have a chance to go get somebody, you know, for, for cheap and you got a roster spot. Yeah, I think it's worth a shot. I think it's, I think it's worth upgrading now and giving yourself a chance to, to pick somebody up who, you know, could integrate themselves into the rotation down the line. Look, Danny Green shot 45% from three last year, 37 and a half the year before, 43 the year before, 38. I'm going backwards, 38, 40 and a half, 36.7, 45. He's got a history um, of being able to hit these shots. And In so, big moments. Yeah. And so that's that's not going to phase him. Okay. So, again, at the at a minimum, that's I, I see no issue with that. Um, so I'm all for adding, adding a guy like that. I'm with you on Hauser because here we are. He's, he's, I, I didn't see exactly. I forgot what exactly what he is now through three games, but I, I do know that if he goes five for five in the next game, he's shooting 40% for the season and he can easily go five for five. Cause he's done. It. So, so yeah, there's, there is some level of, you want a little more consistency from these shooters, but okay. Yes. However, I do believe that this preseason was so meaningless to the Celtics that these guys never really got the full reps that they they really needed to feel comfortable. Like, it's great to be out there playing 25 minutes a game. Sure, you want to see the ball go through a few times, and that's going to ca- give you the confidence to carry into the season. But I think for Hauser in particular, he's – he's a guy that is going to be asked to do a lot of different things, right? Like he's not just the spot up shooter. You have to crash. You have to defend. You have to rebound. He's a good, he's got good size. So he's going to have to rebound. He's going to have to get in there and try to take a charge or switch onto somebody and defend that person without fouling and, and, and make some sort of impact. And all of that does impact his ability to sometimes make a shot. Okay, so he he still has to figure out where in the in the in the minutes with Tatum and Brown and Porzingis and those guys does he find that comfort level? Where where does he find that like okay, I'm I'm good. I'm in rhythm here. I feel confident in my shot. Maybe he never does. Maybe he just this is just who he is and he's always going to be that kind of like um maybe he bounces around the league and, and and plays 12 years, but plays for like eight different teams that just want him for some, some quick three point shooting. And you know, it's, it's good enough. Um, I don't know, but I'm, I'm willing to give it time because they haven't had the exact, this exact kind of uh, scenario, this exact type of setting where they're going to play the way they're supposed to be playing. So I'm I'm very, very kind of patient when it comes to the bench and, and their struggles because this bench is full of guys with specific kind of yeah. like skills. They're not like great. It's not like you had Malcolm Brogdon that you put on the bench last year that can do a lot of different things and, and, and is so good that you're like, he's going to perform. It's... It, you're cop. You kind of cobble together a bunch of guys, and you're like, I don't know. I I, I do think it's going to take a little bit of time for them to kind of gel. But 
a guy like Danny Green out there, why not? Like, why not add him to the mix? And if that means that Lamar Stevens isn't happy, well, you know, so be it. But, um, you know, or or you know, there are going to be people who going to be like, why not just give Shvi Mikhailuk some some minutes? Like, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe that's the answer. But uh, I just think it's funny that two rivals have made moves and Boston has the potential to like go get Drew Holiday out of the Milwaukee move and go pick up Danny Green because because Philly's like, we got to wave somebody and that's probably the easiest choice. The Celtics may be like, ooh, he actually kind of fits this little tiny puzzle piece in the yeah. corner that actually kind of like is a, that's a good fit for us. We can, thank you. Like two rivals make these moves and it's like, oh, thank you. Very good. Appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, other takeaways here from well, I'll, I'll give it off to you here. What other the the bench is bad right now is a takeaway. We all get it. Uh, are varying degrees of patience on that. What's yeah. what's some of your other thoughts here? Man, Drew Holiday's so good, man. <laughs> <laughs> a guy like, that's not getting a lot of discussion right now. Because you feel like it's not getting a lot of discussion. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, well, I don't know. I, I feel like in, in the grand scheme of things, we've talked about Porzingis a ton and yeah, you know, Jalen's Look, gone off and Jason and all that. I just I, I'm so I'm so impressed um by his you know, I mean, obviously mostly his defense. Like I just think like um, you know, we have we, we haven't really seen him go off offensively yet, but I mean it's just like there was a certain level of certainty that you had yesterday watching him um defend Jordan Poole. You're just like, oh, okay. Jordan yeah, Poole yeah, is yeah. in for a tough night. And it was, you know, like he tries to post up Drew Holiday. Drew Holiday goes nowhere and Jordan Poole falls <laughs> down and Drew Holiday still goes nowhere. And it's like, that was, that was quite good. And I mean, I do think, you know, I do think there's like a lot of, I, I think there's plenty of offensive chemistry that needs to develop. I mean, this is for Holiday. This is a weird situation. I mean, in, in, in Milwaukee, everybody kind of had their defined roles around Giannis. Right. And now it's like, everybody's trying to come up with defined roles around Tatum, but also Jalen, but also like Chris Porzingis is, is spacing the floor now. And there's just like, there's a lot of offensive stuff happening. And I think holiday's done a nice job of kind of just, you know, not, he can, he can kind of cruise a little bit on the offensive end. I think that's just fine. And that seems to be fine with him too, but on the defensive end, he's just a monster. Like he's, He's so good. And, uh, you know, he's, he's in the right spot all the time. He, he makes these plays all the time. He's, um, you know, makes a lot of, you know, not to, uh, you know, not, not to, not to ruffle or stir up any feelings for people. He makes a lot of, you know, kind of the defensive highlight plays that, you know, we've used to seeing from Marcus smart. So, um, I, I've just, I, I've been really impressed by him and I, I think it does probably go a little bit under discussed just cause he's not the guy who's scoring 30 right now, but he's a really, really good player. Yeah. And I think the Celtics are going to be ecstatic that they have him down the line. Look, I've said it before. I'm, 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 I've been one of the top Marcus smart guys, uh, around here. It's, you know, I, I believe in the things that I had said about him and all of that. And, and I, I do think there was a path that they could have taken to win with him. Yeah. But it's obvious that this was the right decision. Like it was, there's, I can't argue. And, and, and I think that's maybe the biggest compliment I can give Brad Stevens and Joe and, and the team, like between making the move and having the, the guts to make that move and coaching the players that, you know, buying into the coaching and the coaching execution and the just the ability that these guys have on the floor and the way they they've they've committed to working together it's like yeah i i i have no argument against it like this is this is good i will say it's interesting to to consider and i i know you know we've kind of touched on this before but it is interesting to consider like how different it would look if the Celtics, because because it's not like the Celtics traded Smart for Holiday, like Smart was already gone long before yeah. they knew they were going to have a shot at Drew Holiday. So it is kind of interesting. It's like this shook free for Brad, right? Yeah. And he and he jumped on it and he traded the requisite draft picks and he he traded Rob Williams. He did the things that needed to be done to get Drew Holiday in the door, but there was no guarantee 
that the Celtics right. were going to have some kind of ace, True. Uh, you know, like like lead guard, perimeter guard, defender who could switch a bunch of stuff and defend Julius Randle on the opening night of the season and make Jordan Poole look like a little kid on the third night of this, you know. Yeah. That wasn't a guarantee. That's uh, it's 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 kind of interesting to consider like where um, things might have been had uh, had the game in. trade not gone down the way it did. Yeah, no, that one hundred percent fair. Uh, but 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 here we are. But it did. <laughs> but it did. But yeah. it did. And it's like yes, if if you know what oh. if the um what if the Celtics had gotten uh used Malcolm Brogdon in that trade and Smart was still here, right? You know? and, yeah. and you know there there's that as well. So, um, yeah, I, I agree that the, the, um, there's, we're going to go back through history and say, like, like I just said, like it's Brad Stevens made all the right moves. It's working. And so I love Rob. I love Marcus, all of that stuff, but Hey, these, these moves worked. Um, I think it's, I think it's worth just kind of like flipping the, because I am looking at it as. Rob for Porzingis and smart for holiday, because that is in effect what it is. And like one of my takeaways from the three Oh start is, you know, like round of applause, Brad Stevens, like this is the, what you did. And, and yes, one of the moves was like, Oh wow. That was, a, that was a freebie. You know, that was, that was, <laughs> right, right. you know what I mean? Right. It's like the arrested, uh, arrested development. Uh, maybe when something just happens to go right out of nowhere, you're like, Whoo. Oh, that was a freebie. freebie. That, that was, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But just like anything, y- to succeed, you kind of need a little bit of luck. You kind of need something to break your way. And I'm a huge believer in you make your own luck. And and whenever I say that, and whenever a lot of people who do say that, what that means is you prepare and you put yourself in a position to take advantage of situations that present themselves. Cause a lot of times people every day get hit with a lucky break and they're like, Oh, I can't go to that. Or, Oh, I'm sorry. I can't, I, I got a thing. I can't, I can't work on that with you. And like those types of things present themselves in like, Oh, I'd love to trade for Drew holiday, but God, I just don't have, just really like this one guy and i just I can't i can't like no it's like oh we've got these moves and you you got to put yourself in a position like we are prepared to do blah 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 and we have the the means to do it and we have the guts to do it and we have the motivation to do it yeah. because the bottom line for the celtics is you have a head coach you've made the decision to have a head coach named joe Mazzula, and he has a philosophy And people listening, people watching, you agree, you don't agree with the philosophy, but bottom line is he's the head coach. And the Celtics said, we're giving our head coach what he needs. And they saw the opportunity. They needed shooting at the five and they, they got it Uh, now from both of the guys at the five, they needed shooting all across the board on the floor. And as much as I like Marcus smart, and I, I thought that used the right way, he can be a part of a championship team. That's not how Joe Mazzulla uses them, and that's just not going to work. So bottom line is you look back on it and you say, not only did Marcus get moved in that deal, I might I might say that Marcus might have been moved regardless. Yeah. You know, because, it's possible. Yeah. You know, like it's, it's entirely possible that you look at that team and you say they were going to move him somehow, some way to get more shooting. For two reasons, right? One, because like, like you know, you kind of look ahead at the salaries and stuff like that, and it's like, poof, like you know, there's a lot of problems going going for. But number two, also, they pivoted so fast, like, like it wasn't that wasn't you know, a pivot of a team that's like, ah, we just don't know if we can give up Smart. That was a pivot of a team that was like, okay, I mean, the other guy that we were going to trade this off season was Marcus Smart. So what? What if you know, like that was it was quick. It was it was it was quickly done. You don't move that quick. If you haven't had the discussion, yeah, you know exactly. what I mean. You exactly. don't, move. and like, hey, again, good for Brad, good for these guys for making that move because this move works. And so, um, it's it's my my big take, my biggest, my number one takeaway is 
still a work in progress, still obviously three games in, still still things that if you really get down into the film room, like if you were to sit down with Joe Mazzula in the film room, he'd be like, oh, this is wrong. This read is wrong. Got to do this. And you go through it all, and you'd be like, there, there's plenty to work on. But every time they make a wrong read, it's still, oh, it's Porzingis taking a shot. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, oh, Porzingis didn't set that pick right. Um, so it just it just became a Jason Tatum ISO that, right. that he got to the rim against a I mean, mismatch. Like, yeah, against, <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like, oh, they yeah. didn't swing it one more time to a wide open Jalen Brown or Drew Holiday in the corner. It just ended up being a Derek White three pointer that you know, like or something like the mistakes they're making this year are leading to like good things anyway. So they're three and zero, oh, and I, I'm I'm impressed with how much things are working. Yeah. Um, and that that's my biggest takeaway that even though the bench has struggled, even though it's it can be a little choppy from here, you know, time to time. And sometimes they make mistakes and they they give up some easy looks, but they're they're finding their way and they're doing the things that they're supposed to do. I, I, I'll, my final my final word is this. If we just didn't look back at the previous seasons, right? And have all of this baggage that went along with the Celtics and Tatum and Brown and being so, you know, coming up short and all that stuff. If you just landed on this planet, you know, this season, you'd look at the Celtics and say, that's just a normal, good team with some new players that they're working in. You know, they won some tight games. They finished, they're, they're good enough to finish down the stretch and they just blew the doors off a bad team. So, like this is just a normal good team and it just looks normal. Right. I mean, a, a normal, really good team. Yeah. Like I think because I think if you tender working in two yeah. new star players. No, totally. And and I think you look at the first few games, right? And like like throw the Washington game out. Like just ignore it. I, I mean, I like really they're not gonna be that much better than every team they play. The Wizards stink. Stink. They they're bad. so bad. They are very <laughs> very bad it was obvious from the like the second possession that last night was going to be a blowout like that was tom a- they lost daniel gafford for the game right before and it was devastating daniel <laughs> gafford not playing in that game just crushed them they never had a chance and now maybe gafford changes things a little bit but you know protects the rim a little bit and it maybe it's no problem with Daniel easy. Gafford. He's a fine oh, he's, player. He's yeah. a fine player. He's yeah. a fine player, Tom, but he shouldn't be the absolute demise, the the flushing of the toilet when when it's like, "Oh, Daniel Gafford's out with uh, an ankle injury." The reaction shouldn't be like, "Oh god, we're screwed. We cannot stop these guys inside at all." And that's what happened. <laughs> that's 100% what happened. Um so throw that game out completely, right? I think if you look at the first two games and you look at the way Jalen struggled in game one, and obviously it became this big storyline because Jalen just signed a big contract and Jalen had his struggles last year and everybody wanted to freak out about Jalen. Jalen struggles game one and it's like, no problem. Tatum and Porzingis are here to pick up the slack. Tatum struggles a little bit in game two. No problem. Jalen and Derek White are here to pick up the slack. When you just go up and down this roster and the fact that this team has that many weapons that on any given night, if one guy struggles, it's just it's just three guys there who can all pick up the slack entirely and just crush everybody, you know, crush the other team as an as another duo. I mean, you know, literally any given night, if, if two players struggle, they can still have two guys who can win a basketball game, win them the basketball game like that's mm-hmm. th- that that's th- that is a crazy top six. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's, I, th- I think to your point that that's where we're at right now t- to me after, at, after a three Oh start, it's just th- this team has so many different ways to beat you. And yeah, like you said, Joe Mazzula can probably sit down in a film room and pick out a thousand things that he doesn't like on any given night. And that's all fair. That's all valid. That's all start of the season stuff. That's all working in chemistry. That's all new guys trying to, you know, acclimate to a new place, but you know, end of the day, it doesn't, you know, it hasn't mattered the first three games because they've just got so much talent. And I think 
especially when you kind of hear the way people are talking about trying to win a title, when you hear the way people are talking about trying to play together, I think this team kind of has a lot of, it's just, it, it's a lot of, of boxes checked mm. on their, on their contender card. You know, there's like more than they've ever had in, in recent memory to me. Um, there's just, there's, they got, you know, you can knock on all the wood you want to, but there's a lot going right here. I feel there's like there's a lot. Season. Is a lot. Think and, and with all the stuff going wrong, the Celtics are seventh in offense so far and set like in points per game and offensive rating without with the benefit of like big contributions from the bench. Yeah. Right. Like they're still putting up 117 points per 100 possessions. And uh I think it's let me see, points per game. It's it's a, it's actually 117. That's it's they they must be averaging 100 possessions per game because it's 117.7. That's the oh. exact points per game is their exact offensive rating. So <laughs> they're still putting up 117 points per game yeah. without benefit of meaningful bench contribution. So really good, really good so far. And um, yeah, we'll leave it. And at the that. Wizards stink, and the Wizards are awful, just terrible. And we knew that coming into the season. So we did, we did. Not a surprise. All right, appreciate you, Tom. Appreciate you, man. Tom Westerholm, everybody. Tom underscore NBA on the tweets, the X's, uh, whatever the hell they want to call themselves. Uh, I'm John Corrales. If you're new to this program, thank you very much. Uh, love having you on board. Tomorrow, post-game podcast, Celtics and Pacers, so much later drop than usual. Post-game podcast generally very early in the morning, like 2, 3, 4 in the morning sometimes. So uh, but it'll be there for you when you wake up or depending on where you are in the world, maybe it'll just be there at a normal time for you. So make sure you are subscribed wherever you get your podcast. You can watch the show on YouTube. And if you are watching the show, if you are enjoying the show here, if you're an everydayer with me Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday or Monday through Sunday, whatever it is, I hope you share the podcast, spread the word, tell your friends, tell everybody they should be listening to and watching the Lockdown Celtics podcast right here on the Lockdown Podcast Network. It's your team every day.